All right, I'm going to provide a third example here for making up a buffer solution. And this one comes straight out of your book, um, chapter nine in monoproduct acids. So question asks how many milliliters of a half molar sodium hydroxide solution should be added to 10 grams of Tris HCl to give a pH of 7.6 with a final volume of 250 mL. So I'm going to walk you through the math and then I'm going to walk you how um, one would actually make this in the lab. And then I'll walk you through finally why uh, why the theory and the practice probably won't match. What are some of the errors uh, in the assumptions that we're using to make this thing? So this situation is slightly different than what we talked about before where you have uh, some amount of both the acid and the base. Uh, whether that's a weak base and it's conjugate acid or a weak acid and it's conjugate base. We have both of them, we mix them together, simplest uh, possible buffer you can get. What's more common um, practically is that you have either the weak base or the weak acid, and then you have a strong acid or base that you're going to add to create some, um, some amount of the conjugate. Um, just because we often don't have um, both the acid and the base pair uh, in, a, in, a, in a practical form um, for every single buffer, but it can be easily generated. And so um, in this case, we have TRIS-HCl which we just talked about in the previous video, um, that's the protonated form of the base. So I'm just gonna simplify that by writing it out as BH plus. Um, and then we have pure uh, sodium hydroxide, a uh, half molar solution of it, which is just a strong base. And so what we're really doing is taking the protonated form BH plus, we're adding strong base and we're making some uh, amount of the B and, and, or the base. And we want to add just enough of the hydroxide such that the ratio between BH plus and B uh, gives us a pH of 7.6. So of course we're going to need the henderson hasselbalch equation, um, but I'm going to write this up in this case just to keep track of um, all of our steps. So first thing I did was just take the 10 grams of the oops, uh, of the Tris HCl uh, using the molecular weight, which is 157.596 grams per mole, and then I converted that to moles. That gives me this uh, initial moles here. Um, of 0.0635. And so the way that I have this written out is, you know, in the beaker, right? Let's just imagine that we've got this beaker. You got the beaker or the volumetric flask, uh, whatever you're adding this into, and you've got um, BH plus in there, and you have 0.0635 moles of it hanging out. Now you need to figure out how much of the hydroxide uh, in the form of half molar sodium hydroxide aqueous you need to add to the system to produce the ratio of uh, conjugate acid and base that you want. So we're gonna add some amount of hydroxide, but we don't know what that is. So we're gonna say that's some X amount of addition. And to begin with our approximation, even though this isn't completely true, because if you have BH plus in the system, it's probably gonna re-equilibrate. We're gonna say it's nominally zero. Uh, and that H2O we don't care about because it's a, it's a pure liquid, so it doesn't factor anyway. So then at the end of this, after we add the OH, we know that the hydroxide um, is going to react with BH plus to completion because you get a strong base and a weak acid. And we would know that this, the K for this, uh, as I alluded to in previous videos, is actually going to be one over uh, KB because um, if you think about this reaction here, base plus water, that would have been KB. But since this is the reverse of that, this is one over KB, KB being a small number if it's a weak uh, acid. So one divided by a very small number gives me a K that's much, much greater than one. So uh, anytime you're adding like a strong base or a strong acid, you can assume it's going to completion simply because that reaction has a very large K. Uh, and so because of that, we assume that all of the hydroxide is gonna chew up, whatever amount we add is gonna chew up the same amount of the protonated form, the BH plus. So we subtract that X, all of the X goes away because it all reacts with BH plus. So we're back to zero at, at equilibrium or not really zero, but um, whatever's left just simply from the dissociation of water. And uh, that X that we added here, this, this X that we're subtracting from BH plus, where does that go? Well, it just goes to create the B. So it's the same X that we have here and then water doesn't matter. So this is not really a nice table, it's more of just an accounting table because we're not, we're not allowing equilibria to occur, we're not computing that because the K is so large. This is simply just to keep track of um, how much of the BH plus gets destroyed and in return how much of the B gets created.
so then we just need to throw this stuff into the henderson hasselbach equation. We have the pH. We know the pKa from the previous problem, which was 8.075. Uh, your book uses 8.072. So I'll use 8.072 in this problem, even though I used a slightly different one, just to be consistent with the answer in your book. So pKa equals 8.072. pH, the desired pH is 7.60. Um, and we have... Uh, some values that we could input for B and BH+. Plus. Um, small sort of an as aside here is that I have not placed B and BH plus in brackets um, because I, these do not need to be concentrations at this point. And this is actually a, an important distinction. When we're talking about buffers, um, the pH here that you compute using the Henderson-Hasselbach equation is actually independent of volume. And why is that? Well, if you look at the, the expression here, if it's concentration of B over concentration of BH+, plus, what that really is implying is that it's moles of B over liters of solution divided by moles of BH+, plus over liters of solution, the same solution. Those go away, and really what you're left with is the ratio of moles. The, the volume doesn't matter. Uh, what's interesting about that is that if you've got this beaker and you add these part this particular ratio to achieve the pH that you're interested in 7.6 if you add then to that a whole bunch of water to dilute that in principle as long as that water is really pure and not full of CO2 uh, that won't change the pH because the pH of the system is buffered uh, and set to 7.6 simply based on the mole ratio not on the molar ratio liters don't matter of course, that's within reason, right? If I added, if I had a beaker and I added a million gallons of water uh, and took this to the extreme, that wouldn't that would change things because the concentration of B and BH plus still needs to be considerably more than what you would get simply from the dissociation of water, which at equilibrium is 10 to the minus seven, right? This is where we get into systematic treatment. So as long as you're not diluting your buffer into the sub-micromolar range, right, 10 to the minus 7 would be 0.1 micromolar. As long as you're not in that region, as long as you're well above, say, 10 micromolar, then dilutions uh, with pure water will not affect the buffered pH. So that's, that's sort of an important aside. So let's solve this now. That gives us an expression that looks like this. So I just popped in the pH and the pKa, and then I put x in for B and 0 0.0635 minus x for BH, because those were our sort of final condition, assuming they're not re-equilibrating, of course, which is uh, probably a fine assumption, but it's not going to be an exact assumption. Okay, so permutate this, uh, and I get an expression. So if I subtract the 8.072, uh, fr uh, from 7.6, I get minus 0.472. So I need to rate. I need to take 10 to that to get rid of the log term. That gives me this part of the expression there. Uh, rearrange that, solve for x, and I get 0 0.016 moles. Remember that we were we were thinking and talking in terms of moles here, not in terms of concentrations. Uh, and we have a final volume of 0 0.250 liters. So um, we need to take that into consideration. And at the same time, the question, remember, it was asking is how many milliliters of this base do we need to add to the system? So we just figured out X here, which told us the moles of hydroxide that we need to add, and we have some concentration there. So let me, um, I'll uh, move this over here. So I move the number of moles up here, and then I'll do a little dimensional analysis, knowing that we have half molar NaOH, uh, and I need this many moles. All I need to do then is take 0 0.500 um, moles of NaOH, which is the same as OH because it's strong base, per 1,000 milliliters, uh, which is the same as one liter, so that's 0.5 molar. Um, those units cross, go away, and I can solve this. And this gives me a value, let's see, of uh, 32.0 milliliters. So what that really means is you're going to take your, your vessel and you're going to add your 10 grams of tris hydrochloride. You're probably going to add a little bit of water 
uh, you're going to measure out 32 milliliters and then you're going to uh, fine tune this um, to the desired pH with a little bit of HCl or NaOH. So how to do this in practice, step by step, uh, what I would do and what your book would do, um, which is the sort of most practical way, would be to start with a beaker um, and weigh out your uh, 10.0 grams of Tris HCl. So you weigh that stuff out. Um, second step, add to, um, we're trying to get to a final volume of 250, so I'd probably add this to a 250 mil empty beaker. And then I would um, probably add about um, 100 mils of water to the beaker. Uh, and so at this point, you've got a beaker and you've got roughly 100 mils, so less than half of the 250 is filled. You've got your 10 grams of Tris HCl in there. And then what I do is take your half molar NaOH, um, and you would roughly know that you need about 32 mils of it. So I'd probably go through and add maybe about 30 mils ish. Uh, toss 30 mils, so I'll add that step. Add roughly close to, but a little less than 30 mils of your 0 0.500 molar NaOH solution. Um, then you're going to want, you could have done this step. This step doesn't really matter. Uh, it could be here too. <clears throat> it's interchangeable. You're going to take a pH electrode, calibrate it before you put it in, and then of course drop it in so that you can read the pH of the solution. Uh, so at this point, um, you'll then just continue to add the NaOH solution to desired pH uh, until you get to pH 7.60. Uh, hopefully you don't overshoot. If you do, then you can just add a little bit of strong acid to go back the other way. That's the beauty of these things. They're totally reversible. Um, and then at that point, you've got roughly 100 mils in this beaker um, plus a little bit, uh, plus 30 mils from here. Um, maybe 135, 150 at maximum. So the last step then would be to pour or um, transfer contents of beaker uh, into your 250 mil volumetric. The reason you don't do this all in the volumetric to begin with is because you can't fit a pH probe in there. The necks of volumetric flasks are too narrow for the diameter of a pH probe. So often if you're making up buffers, you're doing this um, in a beaker. Uh, that's roughly the same volume, but you're using volumes that are less so that you don't overfill because you want to keep the volume uh, substantially less than what you're going to bring it to, uh, obviously, so that you can bring it up to volume. So then you pour the contents over there, and the last step would be bring uh, up to 250 mils using a volumetric uh, with water. And you mix that up and stir it really well. And um, that may um, you know, not sit well with you because you're making a solution in just sort of a rough 100, 100 mils-ish, uh, and then you're bringing it to volume. But remember that the pH is independent of volume to a degree. Uh, and that's why this works in a buffered situation because we know that the ratio that is important to the pH is the mole ratio and not the molar concentration ratio because the liters cancel out in this ratio. So it's not important as long as you're not, you know, using like one milliliter and then adding that to a 10,000 gallon tank uh, in which your dilution factor is going to be so large that the concentration is going to be low enough that um, the contribution from water will be important. But for any practical solutions that you're going to make in the lab, this is the method that you'll want to use. Mass it out in a beaker, add your solution, add a little bit of water, add a pH electrode that's calibrated, add your base or acid, depending on whether you're starting with an acid or a base, till you get to the desired pH, transfer that over to the desired volume in the volumetric flask, bring it up to volume, and then you're good to go. So I've alluded to this along the way a couple times, but I just want to give you um, a little bit more perspective as to why uh, when you're making up a buffer and you use a Henderson Hasselbach and you're feeling really good about it, you mix these things up, you pop your pH probe in there, and then uh, it's not what you're expecting.
Um, usually it's close, uh, as long as you did your math right, but it's not spot on. Why is that? Well, um, there's a few reasons uh, that, I, that I just tossed in here. One, a uh, huge one, is that you might have ignored activity coefficients. And this is especially important when, well, when you have uh, activities or um, ionic strengths that are high. So when mu is much less than zero, that's a big deal right? Because then the apparent concentrations of each of those species deviates from ideality quite a bit. They're much lower, uh, and so the equilibriums all shift. At the same time, uh, if you ignore activity coefficients, um, you are, you, the values you're measuring, remember, with a pH probe are activities, not concentrations. And so there's deviation there because you're measuring activities you're computing in concentrations. So there's also inherent error just simply based on that. So if you're making really concentrated buffers or buffers that have a bunch of other stuff in there, this is, this is a big issue, which is no big deal because um, you can always in practice just fine tuning your buffer by adding more base or acid. So you know this is just to give you some sort of context. Um, another thing is the temperature, right? Um, temperature, all equilibria, uh, if you remember, uh, K is going to be equal to um, whatever the exponent is, uh, standard delta G um, over RT. Um, and T means that uh, K is exp exponentially dependent uh, upon 1 over T, negative 1 over T. And so it's got this complex relationship with T, but it's exponential, which means that all the equilibria are highly dependent on T. So if you do all of your math and your calculations assuming ideality at 25.0 C and you are in a cold lab and it's um, you know 15 C, as many labs are quite a bit colder, uh, all your equilibrium are going to be shifted depending on whether they're endothermic or exothermic, one direction or the other. At the same time, uh, your pH probe is also going to change uh, just simply based on um, the relationship of the mechanism by which you're sensing. So, Temperature is huge, always huge um, in labs. Third one here is that it says the approximations that HA equal FHA and A minus equal FA minus could be an error uh, and likely are an error. Um, and this is the one that I've alluded to several times. And that's when you go through your Henderson Hasselbalch equation, you get this ratio of A minus over HA. And you say, okay, the concentrations that I compute for each of those, I'm just going to mix them together, and it's good. That's the assumption. So that would be the formal concentration of A minus, and this would be the formal concentration of HA, because those are the things we're adding into the solution, but we're not assuming they're the true concentrations, because these things are going to re-equilibrate somewhat as A reacts with water to go back towards HA, and HA does the same thing with water to go back towards A minus. And so in certain situations, this may be more um, prone than others. Uh, number four is a funny one. The PKA reported for Tristan, your favorite table, is probably not what you would measure in your lab. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned, measuring Ks for things, especially lar very large or very small Ks, is trouble. It's, it's problematic. It's difficult to do. And so there's a range of values out there. So when we talk about these things as constants, what we mean is they're they're constants in the, in the form of the equation, meaning they are ratios that are fixed. It doesn't mean they're constants that are fundamental constants that as chemists or physicists we know absolutely. They vary quite a bit because they're empirical values. They're not theoretical values, and so they can range quite a bit. So if you used one Ka or pKa uh, and not another, and there's a range of them, that's certainly going to give you deviation or could give you deviation in terms of your buffer. And then uh, five is, is hilarious. This, this comes from your textbooks. You will probably make an ar arithmetic error anyway. Uh, so computing buffers is always a pain. Um, I don't know anybody that really likes to do it, um, but it's not that hard once you do it occasionally. It, but it is helpful to know that there's a lot of stuff that goes in to uh, impacting exactly what the pH of the system is. And the general takeaway is it doesn't matter because empirically we can adjust that with just a few drops of acid or base. Uh, and so in this class, I'm probably going to ask you both things. Um, you know, we're not doing in-person lab per se, uh, but I may ask you on a quiz or exam to walk me through the practical steps to make a particular buffer uh, and tell me how that deviates from, say, the theoretical. 
so again, this is this is a really practical class, and, and that's why um, you know I often ask you, you know, how do you actually do this? Because that's more important to me than uh, sort of the theoretical, developing that intuition.